Amen. Have a seat. Grab your Bible. Open it up to Deuteronomy chapter 6, where we were last week, and we'll continue there this morning. Good to see you. God bless you. If you're here today, you can be here. You can thank God for that, because there's a lot of people, even this week, folks from our church, and they're, you know, they had surgery this week. They can't come, or some of them are sick, or very, they got various problems, and uh, one family has a little boy in the hospital, so... If you're here to, able to be here this morning, you can thank God for it and ask God to open your ears and let you hear what God wants to say to you this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you, in your lifetime, make a mountain of money and you are incredibly famous, everybody knows your name, and you can do all kinds of things that other people just dream about doing, but you can do them. What difference does it make if you're not really on your way to heaven? And if you're not taking your family with you? We are talking about priorities. And you know, this life is so short and it goes by so quick. And we want to make sure that we don't waste it. Uh, we said at the very first Sunday, we don't want to play marbles with diamonds. We don't want to waste our life. And so we've been talking about priorities, what is really important. And the very first Sunday, we talked about right relationship with God. If you don't have that, what do you have? Right relationship with God. And it is through his son, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for us and rose from the dead and now intercedes for us. And the Holy Spirit came and drew us to himself and we can have right relationship with God. What an incredible blessing. And the God of the universe is, if you know anything about the, the universe, God's beyond all of that. And yet he is right here in this room this morning. What an incredible thing. We can have relationship with him. And then the second thing is we want to develop that relationship. We do not want to be 80 years old and have the Christian faith of an eight-year-old. We don't want to do that. We want to grow up in our faith. And so we want everybody to learn to listen to God in his word and to communicate with God in prayer and to be immersed in the people of God. God put this Christian life together so that you live it out in community. You don't live it out all by yourself out there. You need other believers. And that will help us. That's not all, but that will help us to grow, to develop our right relationship. And then last week we began to talk about taking people to heaven. And we specifically talked these two weeks about taking our family to heaven. Because listen, if you have a mom or dad that don't know Jesus Christ, if you have a sibling, if you have children or grandchildren who do not know Christ, who do not have a real relationship with God through Christ, then what is more important than you doing everything you can to make sure that they have that relationship? So that's what we're talking about last week and this week. We got started in Deuteronomy chapter 6 last week. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is the recording of Moses talking to the children of Israel. And he's telling them how they can pass on their faith. And in verse 2, he said he was talking to them so they could pass it on to the son and their grandson, four different generations here that are being spanned. And he said, we've got to keep passing on this faith. Now, we saw last week that this is the way they passed on the faith in the Old Testament people of God. But even today, as the New Testament people of God we can still learn from what they did all the way back then. There are things that we still pick up on and we still practice. And so we want to learn that this morning. Let's read the text and then we'll see what God has to say to us. A little bit of review and then some new things. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, the judgments, which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it. So that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes, his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life. And that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it. That it may be well with you. That you might 
multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Moses said, this is how you pass on the faith. You want to keep on passing it on and we want to do that as well. Now, what is the faith? He sums it up in verses 4 and 5. And Jesus said in the New Testament, these are the greatest commandments. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. There is just one God. In those days, they lived in a land where there were a plethora of gods, Dagon and Baal and Molech and all these other gods. But he said, but God is the only true God. The Yahweh God is the only true God. He is one. And you will love him with all your being. Since he is the most important thing and the most important personage in all the universe, you love him with everything about you. And now in our day, we know that God has sent his son into the world so that we could know him. And our eyes would be opened and our sins would be paid for and access would be made into the very presence of God. And we can talk to him and we can commune with him, have a relationship with him. And it was important then, it's even more important now because of what Christ has done. This is our faith. And many of us, or most of us here know it, but the question this morning is, how do we pass it on? In a sewer society, in a wicked world, how do we pass on our faith? Well, we saw last week as we began, we'll review a little bit, that we internalize the faith. Chapter 6, verse 6 says, these shall be... It shall be on your heart. And so when it's on your heart, then it's not just in your head. It's not just on tablets of stone, but it's in your heart. A lot of people know things, but if you're not living those things, then you're off track. He said, these words shall be on your heart. It's what you really live out is what is this heart desire, not just this head knowledge. One illustration. If I were to go around today and say, how many of you believe in exercise? How many of you believe exercise is really good for you? Well, we've all read enough. We would all raise our hand. Oh, yeah, yeah. We all believe it. And then I would go around and say, now, how many of us exercise faithfully? And far less hands would go up. Okay. You read this week, didn't you, that uh, most people January 1st make this New Year's resolution. They're going to exercise every day, and by January 12th, they've quit. You know? Because we say we believe it, but until we really begin to be faithful with it, do we really believe it? It's the same with Christian faith. If I said, how many of you believe Jesus is the most important thing in the world? Oh, everybody's hand will go up. Yes, 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 we do. But how many of us try to live like Jesus Christ is the most important thing in all the world? See, that's the difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. These things will be written on your heart. You will internalize them. Second, you will exemplify them. You will live them out. You will set an example. He said over and over in this text, he said, you will, you will obey these things. You will walk in them. You will not veer to the left or to the right. You will fear the Lord. You will keep his statutes all the days of your life. You will not just have this faith, but you will live this faith out. You will exemplify it. And folks, if we want to pass it on to our kids, if we don't have the real thing, and if we don't live it out, then how are they going to follow it? And so we got we to gotta set the example. We said last week, nobody's going to do it perfect. And when we mess up, we need to go and we need to apologize to those who have seen us foul up. But we need to live a consistent Christian life so that they see this is the way the Christian, not just that we talk it, but we walk it. Not just that we do lip service, but we live it. We exemplify it. In the Old Testament, there's a story of a man who most of his life exemplified the faith. 
King David. He was a man after God's own heart. When he was young, he stood up to a giant. When King Saul tried to kill him, he didn't retaliate in kind. He didn't take revenge. He, God used him to write most of the Psalms. I mean, this was a great man in many, many ways. But in probably his middle age, he got those middle age crazies, and he looked over that wall, and there was Bathsheba, and he committed adultery. And he had her husband killed to cover it up. And so what was he exemplifying? Adultery and murder. And his sons grew up seeing that. They knew it. He thought he covered it up, but God knows everything, and the people probably knew. And God said, the sword will not depart from your house. There will be consequences. And so his sons grew up. And Amnon, one of his sons, looked at his half-sister Tamar, and he by force molested her. Her brother was Absalom. Of course, that made Absalom mad, and so he murdered Amnon. And later on, Absalom tried to, he rebelled against his father, David the king, and tried to murder him as well. Now, where did those boys learn that? They had wicked hearts on their own, just like all of us left to ourselves. They had wicked hearts, but they had seen their dad do it and, quote, get away with it. And we've got to be careful what we're living out. I have seen parents, all my ministry, tell their kids one thing and live totally the other thing. And the kids are going to go by my, more by what they see than what they hear. We exemplify the faith. And if we're not doing that today, listen, we serve a powerful God. And you can call out to him today and you can say, Lord, I have made a mess. I have exemplified the wrong things. But, Lord, would you change me? And by your power, would I really begin to live out a godly life in front of my children and my grandchildren? And God can help you do that. Third thing we do is this, and this is new territory. We inculcate the faith. Now, that's not a word we use a lot, but it fits this perfectly. It means to instill with persistence. We could say indoctrinate, but that has kind of a negative connotation. We could say educate, but that's a little too bland. If we inculcate the faith, we are instilling it with persistence. And that's what he tells us to do. After he tells us what the faith is in verse 4, then he says in verse 6, they shall be on your heart. And then he says, you shall teach them diligently to your sons. And talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. And he said, and you, and you will put some of this word on your hand and on your forehead and on the doorpost of your house. And your whole life is permeated with this truth. And you instill it, you inculcate it to your family. Notice what he says here. He says, you shall teach it diligently, not just casually, diligently. Some of you are very diligent to teach your children and your grandchildren their manners. That's a good thing. Some of you want to teach them math or geography. That's good. But listen, what we're talking about here, the faith, this is life and death. This is heaven and hell. This is more important than anything else. If your kids don't know anything about geography, and if they can't do algebra, but they go to heaven, isn't that what really is important? You teach them diligently. Second, you teach them persistently. Now, look, look what he says here. He says, we have got this faith. We want to pass it on, so it's got to be on your heart, and then you begin to teach it. You walk it, then you talk it. And he says, you teach it diligently to your sons and you talk of them all through the day. When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you are persistent. Now notice what he's saying here. He says, when you're trying to instill the faith and you're trying to pass it on, you don't give a monthly lecture. Okay. You don't set your kids down or your grandkids once or twice a year and say, listen to me for an hour and I'm going to tell you all about the faith. Especially if you've got little boys, they can't sit there over 30 seconds anyway. Okay. So it has to be just a little at a time. I mean, it's, you don't, you don't bring all the spiritual groceries in the house and expect them to eat it all at one time. 
It's a little bit at a time, a little meal at a time, all throughout the day. That's what he's saying here. He said, when you sit in your house. So maybe you're sitting at the table, or maybe you're having a meal. And at that meal, you bow your heads and you really do give thanks to God for the food. You're teaching them something. And maybe you're going to talk about something of a spiritual nature. Hopefully, at the table. So you're, you sit. As you walk in the way, now very few of us walk anymore, but we drive. So as you're going from one place to another and you're in the minivan or you're in the SUV and you're taking the kids somewhere, and while you're doing that, you can talk of spiritual things. You're looking for ways to do that. Maybe you pass an auto accident and you say, kids, we need to pray for these people. They were in an auto accident and you keep your eyes open, but you pray and the kids hear you pray and they're learning to pray about everything. And then later on, you read or you hear on the news that that happened because somebody was texting or drinking. And so there's another teachable moment for your kids. You remember that accident we saw yesterday? It was because they weren't paying attention to the driving and they were impaired. And, and that's a foolish thing to do. And God doesn't want us to be foolish. And so you're teaching. And then it says, when you lie down, one of the things we love to do with our kids when they're growing up is when they're going to bed, we go in there and get with them by the bed and pray over them as they were going to sleep. And maybe they wanted to talk then about something. And, and then it says, when you rise up, this is the day. Hey, kids, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And, and all along the way, you're imparting spiritual things. Not just one big sermon or lecture, but little bits all throughout the day. We have some great parents in our church. And and one set of great parents were just so good about raising their kids. And one of the kids said later, they said, you know, in our life, everything in our life was a Bible lesson. And I think that's some good parents. That's parents trying to do the right thing. They're trying to inculcate. They're trying to instill with persistence. And that's what you've got to do. Now, listen, sometimes parents think this. Well, I'm going to send my kids to Christian school and they'll do the job. They're there to help. It's not their job. Well, we want Brenda in the children's ministry. We want Michael in the youth ministry. We want Travis in the college ministry to do all the work. We want the pastor to teach him on Sunday. We are to help. God has called us to help. Folks, we have your kids and your grandkids one hour, two hour, three hours a week, maybe. We cannot undo in one, two, three hours a week what the world gives them 24-7. We cannot undo that. You've got to be doing that at home. You talk persistently. You teach. You instill trying to train them up in the way they should go. And then notice it says... Not only diligently and persistently, but also even visibly. It says here the Jews should do this, and some of them took it quite literally. They should have a little bit of Scripture. Remember, they didn't have Bibles, okay? It was too expensive. Everything was hand-copied. They didn't have the materials or the money. But they would take little verses and put them in a little box, and sometimes they would wear it on their hand or on their forehead. They were called phylacteries. Or sometimes they would take a little box and write a scripture, one, one scripture, and put it on the doorpost. And when they came in, they would kiss it to show their reverence. They respected the word of God. It was a, it was a visible reminder. It doesn't hurt us to have some visible reminders. Maybe in your home, you're going to put up a plaque of the Ten Commandments. That'd be a wonderful thing. Be good for our kids to know, thou shalt not kill. Be good. Maybe you're going to put a, a picture of Jesus feeding the little children, taking care of blessing the little children. Maybe you're going to do that. That'd be a good thing. Maybe a special scripture verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You're going to put it maybe up in their room. Just some visible reminders. Here's a good visible reminder. And not just to sit on your coffee table till next Sunday and wipe the dust off of it and then go to church. But, you know, just a reminder is they see you sometimes instead of watching television, you're sitting over there reading the Bible. And they see that. And they're saying, oh, it's not just what they say. It's what they do. 
It's a visible reminder. You can probably think of some other very creative things that you could do visibly that your kids and your grandkids would see. You're trying to instill that faith in them. You're trying to make it be there. Say, Pastor, does it talk about that anywhere in the New Testament? Yes, it does. Ephesians 6, 4 is one place. It says, Fathers, do not provoke your children. Do not exasperate them like some of us fathers do, you know. When you're overly demanding or you're just too harsh all the time or whatever, we can exasperate our kids. But he said, rather, train them up. The idea is not one single thing, but you keep training them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord or the, the discipline instruction of the Lord. You keep training them up like that. It's a consistent thing, and you keep on, keep on, keep on doing it until it is instilled in their hearts. And listen, we plant seeds and then we pray over those seeds that they will come up and they will bear fruit. And maybe some of you here in this congregation, maybe you, you didn't do it with your children and you know you didn't, but now you got a chance to do it with your grandkids. And wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Russ said it was his grandmother that helped him come to Jesus Christ. And some of you grandmothers, some of you grandfathers out there, you can make a difference in all eternity. Maybe you look and you see how your kids are raising their children and you think, boy, they are messing up. But you can do some very, very good things. We inculcate. We instill. And finally, we intercede we pray. doesn't talk about that in this passage, but another place in the life of Moses it does. Here he gives them the first three things we've talked about. But in another place, in Exodus, it shows him interceding for the people. The children of Israel. I wonder why they're called children. <laughs> they always acted like it. The children of Israel rebelled against God. They said, God, we don't want to do what you say. We're going to do what we want to do, like a lot of us say. And. God said to Moses, Moses, get out of the way. I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to start over with you. These rebellious, these hard-headed, these obstinate people, they will not do what I say. I'm going to wipe them out. And the Bible says Moses interceded for those people. He cried out to God. He said, oh, God, please spare them. Lord God, please don't destroy them. And God listened to that intercession. Paul interceded for his own people in Romans 10.1. It says, my heart's desire and my prayer for the Jews is that they would be saved. See, he interceded. He cried out. He prayed. And that is so critical and so important. Now, I want to give you some bad news and some good news, okay? The bad news is this. That you can be the most wonderful parent. You can internalize your faith. You can exemplify it. You can live it out. You can instill it in your children. And do you know what? At the end of the day, your children are still free moral agents. And they can make their own choice. Billy Graham was an incredible man. And his son Franklin, as a teenager and as a young adult, was a pitiful mess. So you can do all the right things, and your children can still choose wrong. We live in a wicked world. Satan has got an incredible plan for taking people to hell. He takes all of this pernicious poison, and he wraps it in spiritual chocolate. And it looks so good, and the world just gobbles it down. And we're gobbling it down today. Perversion and immorality and materialism and rebellion. And we're just gobbling it down. And your kids live, and grandkids live in that every day, and it's on television, it's on all the social media, their friends talk it, the, the vocabulary is horrible. So they live in that, and you're trying everything you can do, and your children still make mistakes. So what can you do when that happens? What can you do when your, maybe your grown-up children tell you, look, 
Mom, Dad, don't even talk to us about that anymore. What if your siblings that you've been praying for say, don't even talk to, that, to us about that anymore. We don't want to hear it. You know what? You can talk to God. And God is more powerful than your children and your siblings and your parents. And you can talk to God. I tell you, my wife and I have lived this. We, uh, three kids. The oldest a daughter was the hardest when she was real young. It would take both of us to give, a, give her a spanking. I mean. Arms flaying everywhere, legs. <laughs> she didn't need them very often. And then once she got a little older, I mean, we just didn't have any trouble with her. Just one of those straight arrow kids, just loved the Lord just the way she is now. She sits right back there with her husband, and she helps lead mom to mom, and just fantastic. And, you know, and if we just would have had that one child, we would have thought, we are the greatest parents in all the world. Why can't everybody do this? So we had our daughter. And then we had our sons. And our sons were like their daddy. See, their daddy got about 15, thought he was the smartest person in the whole world. Smarter than God. Didn't need to listen to God. Didn't need to listen to parents. Just really dumb as a rock spiritually. But, oh, you know. And my boys decided they would do that too. And when they got out of the house, pretty strict at a preacher's house. And when they got out of the house, they decided they'd do what they wanted to do. See how much trouble they could get in. See how far away from God they could get. And it got to a place we could do nothing but pray. There were times they didn't want to come around. And I understand why. They didn't want to come around. We didn't see them, didn't talk to them, didn't have any time to try to sow any good seed. Just prayed, just prayed, just prayed. Never prayed so much or so hard or so passionately about anything. Just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Night and day. Wake up in the middle of the night, pray. Be at the table. Just hurt. Diane and I, we pray. Fast and pray, pray and fast, pray, 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 pray for years, pray, pray, pray. And then like their dumb daddy, the day came when like the prodigal son, they looked up to heaven and they repented. First Micah, then Matthew. Now the whole family is on the road trying to walk toward heaven. But folks, listen, it was bathed in a ton of prayer. Maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you've got a child. They've broken your heart. They have, you've wept a million tears. Maybe you've got a grandchild right now, and that grandchild's rebellious, and you don't know what to do. Here's what you do. You get down on your knees. You get down on your face. You pray. It's more important than that 30-minute sitcom. It's more important than some little recreation. It's more important than the Super Bowl. You pray, and you pray, and you pray. Because our God is a powerful God. And prayers are powerful because we have a powerful God. And we call out to Him. Someday we're all going to die. We're going to stand before God. And on that day, we better have a right relationship with Him. And on that day, we will be so very happy if we set a good example for our kids. If we taught them and we prayed for them. And all together, we walk into glory. Let's pray this morning. Would you bow your heads? Lord God, I know, I know. There's people all over this congregation. They have parents that are not Christians. 
people here that have brothers and sisters that are not Christians. Children and grandchildren that are not walking in the faith. Lord, I pray for these people. Lord, I ask that you help them. And Lord, help us to help us to remember this morning what the scripture says, what the Bible teaches us. We can make a difference in the world, Father. So we pray for people praying for their moms and dads today, people praying for their brothers and sisters, people praying for their children and their grandchildren. Lord, help them to not grow weary, but to pray. To pray without ceasing, in season and out of season. They just keep on praying. Lord, help us all to model the Christian life. Help us to really live it. Help us to teach it. And help us to bathe the whole thing in prayer. Father, help us to do it. Help us not to forget this when we walk out of this room. I pray, Lord, that every one of us would remember And we would make a difference through our prayer, through our lives, through our teaching. Lord, help us to change a generation. Because we ask for that in Jesus' name.